Hello, today I'm going to be talking about the emergence of the Black Power Movement, including Malcolm X and the Black Panthers. The Black Power philosophy that emerged in the Civil Rights Movement during the 1960s had already taken root in the Black Freedom Struggle. As you will recall, there are strains of separatism, especially economic separatism, and of self-reliance in the black community that date back to the age of Marcus Garvey and to the early W.E.B. Du Bois. By the 1960s, the philosophy of black nationalism also owed much of its energy to the decolonization movement in Africa, the European powers that had colonized that continent moved out, and 40 new nation states were created between 1945 and 1960 as a result of these anti-colonial revolutions within those countries. Black power organizations approached the black freedom struggle differently from mainstream organizations like the NAACP and the SCLC. They championed more aggressive measures to tackle American racism and they also established a new psychology among African Americans that was focused on establishing black pride. <clears throat> One of the very early uh, examples in the 1960s of a black power organization was the Revolutionary Action Movement, founded in Ohio in 1962 by Maxwell Stanford. Uh, Robert Williams, who had denounced the NAACP and encouraged armed self-defense, influenced the students group. The organization's membership supported the national liberation movements in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, and made an analogy between the treatment of African Americans in the U.S. as a kind of set of internally colonized peoples and colonial subjects in other occupied zones throughout the world. The Revolutionary Action Movement had a 12-point program for black freedom that included the creation of independent black schools, national black student organizations, rifle clubs, a guerrilla army made up of young people and the unemployed, and black farmer cooperatives. Ram's philosophy, known as black nationalism, was rooted in the idea that <clears throat> black people constituted a nation within a nation whose very survival depended on the exercise of black power. The Black Power Movement disseminated ideas about black pride, black independent economic activity, and the benefits of the militant exercise of political power. Black Power leaders published several papers and books that highlighted their mission and objectives, including Soul Book, Liberator, Negro Digest, Freedom Ways, and the Nation of Islam newspaper, Muhammad Speaks. Now, at the bottom right-hand side of this um, slide, there's a slightly anachronistic poster because this is from later on in the 1960s. But Emory Douglas was the extremely talented artist of the Black Panther movement, and I just love his posters. I think they are so expressive and just so beautifully drawn. So I wanted to um, put in a couple of extras. In addition to independent economic activity and militant political power and the black press, um, black uh, music, paintings, plays, and novels bolstered their message of Afro-American pride. The black arts movement relied on art to project the power and beauty of black culture. So I'm going to show you several slides with paintings from the Black Arts Movement, isn't that beautiful? I love this painting. Again, just a really evocative and beautifully done painting. The Black Power Movement was also focused on restoring and reviving 
black masculinity. They sought to free black men from the emasculating effects of racism. These activists sustained a scathing critique of nonviolent direct action, saying, you know, what you're really doing, people who are participating in the nonviolent movement, is allowing women and children to be brutalized by white segregationists. They also said white men had systematically kept black men unemployed or underemployed to control black families and to protect black, prevent black men from protecting black women. Black power activists argued that black people would only be free when men were free to assume their full patriarchal rights. Now, problematically, women activists were barred from taking leadership roles in the black power movement, just as they had been sort of barred by the regular civil rights movement. Black power leaders and activists bombarded women with demands to stop competing with men for jobs and instead stay home and have babies, quote, for the revolution. Black women within the movement were expected to do menial chores, such as making coffee and cleaning up after the men. When black women objected to performing these tasks and taking on these roles, they were accused of allying with whites. Um, there was also, at the same time that there was this sort of projection of patriarchal authority over black women, there was a celebration of unalloyed um, black beauty the sort of black is beautiful slogan came in. Um, people very much rejected what had long been the beauty standard of having straightened hair and uh, natural hair. The Afro um, came in and there were also, um, there were ways of dressing, ways of walking, and especially ways of greeting each other with particular um, fist bumps or handshakes that came to symbolize black unity, a kind of unspoken communication that um, all uh, African Americans who were part of the black power movement felt unified them. All right, so having given you a little overview of the sort of ideological content of black power, let me talk to you about a couple of specific moments and movements. You've probably heard of Malcolm X, he was born Malcolm Little on May 19, 1925 in Omaha, Nebraska. His mother, Louise Norton Little, was a homemaker who had eight children. His father, Earl Little, was an outspoken Baptist minister and avid supporter of Marcus Garvey. Earl Little's civil rights activism prompted death threats from the white supremacist organization, the Black Legion, forcing the family to relocate twice before Malcolm's fourth birthday. But regardless of the Little family's efforts to elude the Legion, in 1929, their Lansing, Michigan home was burned to the ground. Two years later, Earl's body was found lying across the town's trolley tracks. Police ruled both incidents as accidents, but the Littles were certain that members of the Black Legion were responsible. Louise suffered emotional breakdown several years after the death of her husband. She was committed to a mental institution and her children were split up among various foster homes and orphanages. Without much parental supervision, or really without any after a while, Malcolm Little took part in various incidents of petty crime. And in 1946, he was arrested and convicted on burglary charges and was sentenced to 10 years in prison, although he would be granted parole after seven years of that. While in prison, Malcolm heard about a religious organization called the Nation of Islam and its leader, Elijah Muhammad. Elijah Muhammad taught that white society actively worked to keep African Americans from empowering themselves and achieving political, economic, and social success. Among other goals, the Nation of Islam fought for a state of their own, separate from the one inhabited by white people. By the time he was paroled in 1952, Malcolm was a devoted follower who had changed his surname to X. The idea, um, and a lot of um, members of the Nation of Islam changed their surname to X, the idea being that the surnames they were born with were the surnames of their former slaveholders, which in many cases is true, and 
The X signified a lost tribal name. Intelligent and articulate, Malcolm X was appointed as a minister and national spokesman for the Nation of Islam. Elijah Muhammad also charged him with establishing new mosques in cities such as Detroit, Michigan, and Harlem. Malcolm utilized newspaper columns as well as radio and television to communicate the Nation of Islam's message across the United States. His charisma, drive, and conviction attracted a large number of new members. He was largely credited with increasing membership in the Nation of Islam from 500 people in 1952 to 30,000 in 1963. And again, here on the right, another Emory Douglas poster, Revolution in Our Lifetime. The differences between Malcolm X and Martin Luther King's approaches to black freedom struggle were poignant and clear. Malcolm X criticized civil rights leaders and said that they were sellouts picked by white liberals to keep blacks in their place. Unlike the integrationist black leaders at the forefront of the civil rights movement, Malcolm X argued for land, power, and freedom as opposed to desegregation. He argued that desegregation would not fix police brutality, educational inequity, poverty, or unemployment. So what he was looking for was a much more radical and revolutionary movement. The crowds and controversy surrounding Malcolm X made him a media magnet. He was featured in a week-long television special with Mike Wallace in 1959 called The Hate That Hate Produced. The program explored the fundamentals of the Nation of Islam and tracked Malcolm's emergence as one of its most important leaders. But after the special, Malcolm was faced with the uncomfortable reality that his fame had eclipsed that of his mentor, Elijah Muhammad. In addition to the media, his vivid personality had captured the government's attention. As membership in the Nation of Islam continued to grow, FBI agents infiltrated the organization, with one even acting as uh, Malcolm X's bodyguard, and they secretly placed bugs, wiretaps, cameras, and other surveillance equipment to monitor the group's activities. Now, uh, Malcolm X started to get alienated from the Nation of Islam in 1963 when he learned that his mentor, Elijah Muhammad, had feet of clay, that he secretly was having sexual relationships with as many as six women within the Nation of Islam, and some of these relationships had resulted in children, and the Nation of Islam, you know, had a very strict sexual and moral code, no drinking, no eating of pork, um, people dressed up at all times, very um, strong emphasis on the nuclear family unit. And this discovery that Elijah Muhammad was not who he said he was began Malcolm X's progressive move away from the Nation of Islam. In March of 1964, Malcolm X terminated his relationship with the Nation of Islam and decided to found his own religious organization called the Muslim Mosque Incorporated. He also attended a conference in Cairo sponsored by the Organization of African Unity, which brought together the heads of the newly independent African nations. He told a reporter that his mission at the conference was to remind African leaders that in the United States, 22 million people of African descent were also victims of imperialism. They were victims of American imperialism and that their problem was neither an American problem nor a civil rights problem, but a problem of human rights. In the United States, he would form the Secular Organization of Afro-American Unity modeled after the Organization of African Unity. He wanted to build independent black institutions to address black economic issues, but also to support participation in mainstream politics, both at home and abroad. He specifically wanted to use the United Nations to advocate for African Americans' grievances. So Malcolm X was changing he was changing in his affiliations, in his attitudes, in his strategies. And one of the things that changed him the most was, like many observant Muslims, he made a pilgrimage to Mecca. Now, this pilgrimage proved to be life-altering for him. 
For the first time, Malcolm shared his thoughts and beliefs with different cultures and found the response to be overwhelmingly positive. When he returned, he said that he had met, quote, blonde-haired, blue-eyed men who I could call my brothers. He returned to the United States with a new outlook on integration and a new hope for the future. And this time when he spoke, instead of just preaching to African Americans, he had a message for all races. After Malcolm had resigned his position in the Nation of Islam and renounced Elijah Muhammad, relations between the two had become increasingly volatile. FBI informants working undercover in the Nation of Islam warned officials that Malcolm had been marked for assassination. One undercover officer had even been ordered to help plant a bomb in Malcolm's car. After repeated attempts on his life, Malcolm rarely traveled anywhere without bodyguards. On February 14, 1965, his home was firebombed. Luckily, the family escaped physical injury. One week later, however, Malcolm's enemies were successful. At a speaking engagement in the Manhattan Audubon Ballroom in Harlem, on February 21st, 1965, three gunmen rushed Malcolm on stage. They shot him 15 times at close range, and at the age of 39, Malcolm X was pronounced dead on arrival at New York's Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. Okay, um, Malcolm X certainly cut down just at the moment at which he was starting to maybe move to the center and become a figure who could have uh, united both the black power and the uh, sort of integrationist civil rights movement of Martin Luther King Jr. But um, after he was killed, young leaders like <clears throat> Stokely Carmichael picked up Malcolm X's leadership mantle. Born in Trinidad, so just like Marcus Garvey, born in the Caribbean, uh, Stokely Carmichael immigrated to New York City in 1952, attended high school in the Bronx, and enrolled at Howard University in 1960. There, he immediately got involved with the Civil Rights Movement, joining SNCC and the Nonviolent Action Group. In 1961, Carmichael was one of several Freedom Riders who traveled through the South challenging segregation laws in interstate transportation. For his participation, he was arrested and jailed for about 50 days in Jackson, Mississippi. After he graduated from Howard University in 1964, Carmichael joined SNCC during Freedom Summer in a place called Lowndes County, Alabama. Um, they were doing a voter registration drive and they also helped organize an independent political party because the only political party in Lowndes County was the Democratic Party. It was an all-white party. So they organized something called the Lowndes County Freedom Organization, and they used as their party's emblem the Black Panther. This powerful image would later be adopted by the Black Panther Party. During the period that I'm talking about here up until 1964 or 5, Carmichael and others associated with SNCC supported the nonviolent approach to desegregation espoused by Martin Luther King Jr. But Carmichael was becoming increasingly frustrated, having witnessed beatings and murders of several prominent civil rights activists. In the summer of 1966, <clears throat> James Meredith, the student who had integrated the University of Mississippi, announced that he would march alone from Memphis to Jackson in what he called a march against fear. Two days into the march, an avowed racist named Aubrey jo James Norvell shot Meredith in the neck, back, and legs, although he didn't die, and as of the time of this recording in 19, er, 2018, he's still alive. Civil rights leaders who represented the spectrum of the black freedom struggle philosophies pledged to continue the march in Meredith's honor, but they all marched with different philosophies about which direction the black freedom struggle should take. Martin Luther King represented the old guard, and black power advocates used the march as an opportunity to talk about their new philosophies. During the march, civil rights workers shouted freedom, while black nationalists shouted uhuru, the Swahili word for freedom. Black power activists welcomed the deacons of defense and justice to the march for protection. 
this was a group that believed in arming African Americans, and so they marched around with weapons. On the night of June 16, 1966, Stokely Carmichael gave a speech in which he announced the new turn in the black freedom struggle toward political, uh, toward black power. He called for self-defense tactics, self-determination, political and economic power, and racial pride. This controversial split from King's ideology of nonviolence and racial integration was seen by moderate blacks as detrimental to the civil rights cause and was also viewed with apprehension by many whites. All right, so the James Meredith March is really a turning point in 1966, and then you begin to have this bifurcation of tactics and strategies should white people be involved in the uh, movement for African American civil rights, should it be a, a black only power and nationalist movement or what? That same year in 1966, Oakland residents Huey Newton and Bobby Seale formed the Black Power Party, for, the Black Panther Party for Self Defense. Newton, although having graduated high school not really knowing how to read, readied himself for college and was attending the San Francisco School of Law. He met Bobby Seale um, slightly before that when they were both undergraduates at Merritt College in Oakland. Seale had served in the Air Force and had become radicalized by seeing Malcolm X speak. Okay, living in Oakland as they did, Newton and Seale understood that there was a lot of police repression that went on in urban areas. Black people were constantly getting pulled over and harassed by the police for no sufficient reason. So the party was put together to patrol black neighborhoods to protect residents from acts of police brutality. Eventually, the Panthers advocated that all African Americans be armed, that blacks be exempt from the draft and from all the sanctions of so-called white America, the release from all African Americans from jail, and the payment of reparations to African Americans for centuries of exploitation by white Americans. By the late 1960s, when the Black Panther Party was at its peak, membership exceeded 2,000 people. Chapters were established in Chicago, Indianapolis, Detroit, Patterson, uh, which is in New Jersey, Des Moines, Iowa, and Wichita, Kansas. But the chapter in Oakland was always the most influential. The Panther Party championed a 10-point program, which included many of the principles that other black nationalist organizations had advanced. For example, they wanted self-determination for black people, full employment, decent housing and education, exemption from military service, and end to police brutality. These were among the organization's primary objective. In addition to armed patrolling and nationalist advocacy, the Panthers, especially in Oakland, really did a lot of social outreach. They provided daycare and free breakfast for children. They set up medical clinics. They gave groceries to senior citizens in their neighborhoods. And eventually in the 1970s, they even ran candidates for mayor and city council. At the same time, however, the FBI considered the Black Panthers to be a terrorist organization, and they used a secret offshoot of their program called COINTELPRO to infiltrate the organization with snitches. One of these snitches gave the FBI information that led to the assassination of Fred Hampton. Fred Hampton was one of the Black Panthers' most eloquent leaders. Um, People broke into Fred Hampton's apartment while he was lying in bed and shot him at point-blank range and killed him. As a result of the infiltration um, of the Black Panthers by FBI uh, informants, the Panthers pretty much petered out. They really were not able to uh, withstand the infiltration by the FBI because nobody knew who was um, for real and, and who was an FBI informant. And finally, here you see the uh, diagram that was drawn by the informant to the FBI showing the floor plan of Fred Hampton's apartment so that they would know exactly where he was sleeping when the FBI came in to kill him. All right, so that is it for this lecture. 
And I look forward to hearing any comments that you may have. And so I will see you in the comments.